so you know having this much information last night going into the next day we were aware that there was some market moving news we have the cpi number at 8 30 uh, a couple other ones we listed as well on the channel so there's a good possibility that we could probably possibly just drift until we had that news and then to be some expansion one way or the other so i was i bet on the upside we had this break you know knowing full well that just if we just look in the past when we come down to this level it's not like it makes a decision really quick there's usually some time some balancing that takes place before there's a move one way or the other but when we came back down we're here at this major zone right it's at least a place where buyers can step in that was yesterday's call we have this pause day that was yesterday's sideways call. So I said, okay, uh, there's a good chance that we could have a maybe a turning point up. Um, but I, you know, still knowing that, you know, it's not like based on what happened last time, but this, you know, it could have just been a pop up to here, right? I didn't have to engulf this entire thing. So, right, because there was resistance with this moving average cross and this breakdown here. So we go on the smaller time frames. Yesterday was just a pause, so it was easier to trade. We got another one coming in. There we go. And, you know, the sideways up call was basically saying, hey, this zone here is pretty much done. There was no shorting at this zone anymore. Uh, holding the runner into this zone, this was a good, this was a target for me because I just, I just didn't have faith that this was just going to be a, a trend up day, breaking all of this uh, structure that we've had over the last couple of days. Um, so I got out here, we had a pop up to here, and then we started to balance ahead of this resistance zone. Let's just zoom out. What's up, Mark? Yeah, any questions you guys have about trades you took or anything you could put in the chat? So you could see I had this zone down here marked orange. To me, this is this is this whole, you know, this inverse head and shoulder, or this head and shoulders rather, whether this is gonna whether this pattern is gonna play it or not. I mean, if this zone's broken, I mean that's that's when things can really take off. But you can just see even on first test of this zone, we had a strong reaction up. I didn't get involved after this. You can see right on right at 8:30, this is when the volatility expansion happens. What's great is that once you're already positioned like this, there was absolutely, you know, once this happens, right, this move happened, right? So a lot of amateurs will jump in. Right. And they'll start to buy up here. You know, they're not really thinking about, hey, you know, do are we going to have conviction up into this zone? Right. Because, you know, granted, you could look in the past and say, well, we had a nice launching point up there. Couldn't couldn't we do that again? But yeah, true. But, you know, it was one, two, three, four, three and a half days of balancing first. Right. And here we've only been balancing for like one and a half days. Right. And even as a day trader. Right. I don't even really consider you know, high volume nodes of any import, unless it's a couple days. So this has only been a day and a half. And so if we know that all trends start from balance, we have to have some type of a of rest first, right? So the greater the balance, the greater the trend. So that was one idea about maybe getting out at this point. Um, I'm not saying you had to jump in short, although that would have been a great trade too. But yeah, that's, that's what was happening in bitcoin let's go to the es real quick yes also in this ugly tricky spot because it's like you know we, we had this engulfing pattern that took us up to here and then we paused without any heart, uh, kind of a reaction it took out one day but technically it didn't even take out the second day but the strength of it was notable because if you just look in the past it could shift a time frame just from just from the magnitude of the move you can have another leg up but oops Right. But then, you, you know, so that turning point was above this. We didn't get that pop up into there like I was anticipating. So let's just get rid of this zone. This basically first zone held. And this was actually a turning point down. So when we got down here the next day, it's like we're not really sure who's in control. And that's kind of what the day was. We kind of popped up here, popped back down. We'll go on the smaller time frame here. It was also kind of a tricky day as well, just all around. So this is blue is my initial zone that I had marked on the day. You can just see in the past. It's, uh, launching point here and we have the the low of the first uh first test of that but i mean just you know seeing this attempted breakout and then coming back down i mean this was just um, to me this one trade in the channel that we talked about was sort of a short-term pop up to here 
uh, when you see a pattern like this, this is almost like a selling tail. It's like this thing will, if it doesn't break through here, it's probably going to go lower. And that's that's why I said I wasn't going to buy anywhere near the low the low of the day here at this point in time. Yeah, okay, it broke through, got to this, and almost turned around. But you know, like I said, around all these market moving news, if you're not positioned, I don't like to take on a lot, a lot more risk. Uh, at least uh, you know around the time, couple you know a half hour before, half hour after. And I think, I believe there was two on the day. There was one at 8.30 and I think there was another one at 10.30. That there was basically that Econo day marks the, the major important ones in red. So that's kind of what we have. And you can kind of basically say that this is sort of a neutral day, really. It's just really, you know, taking the first something range, breaking both sides. We're really, um, you know, assuming that it closes somewhere in the middle, no side's really in control. And here's here's a question I have for Corby too, because we talk about these a CCI pattern. Some of them are easier to see than others, like a hook from extreme or like it's a zero line reject or whatever here. Pause. But I I see this sometimes, and I don't know if I'm seeing something. I don't know how much merit to give it, so I don't really mark it. But it's like it's this it's the CCI thing. It's marked Shamu. I don't know if it's something that has an edge or not, or if it's even this little, thing. it's like, basically it looks like it's pulling back and then it pops up. It's, you know, something that at least said that, that would be going up. Now to me, it's like, it didn't really have an edge because there's a lot of Shamu is a garbage. Sorry edge. to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. No edge. So you can't forget about Shamu's. Yeah. Or yeah. anything else, as a matter of fact, as the only thing that other has merit than besides the Vegas and the CCI, and they don't have merit the way they are taught either. This is it's something that's very important. Everybody does always their research instead of just listening to what what really works, what back testing it. And the fact is that this I'm very grateful to all the work that Woody did, but these guys trade without price. Uh, assuming that the CCI is always early and have gazillions of patterns and besides the it's just a momentum indicator I just use out of respect the same word uh, of uh, a zero line reject but I actually we use a very different way in regards to we're pointing out that the further away it's better it has very little to do with the zero line um, and uh, it's always object individual you need to check all these things that regular ta for the most part is all broken because the only edge that it has is that people do it right because other people do it too but all the people who do it is the minority of amateur trading so uh, classical ta has very little very little merit to begin with and this is a very exotic um way of looking through the market by by leaving price patterns completely out and just trading a pure indicator. That's that's just, this is one edge who I would never would want to anybody. So please don't go research these things and try these other patterns because, or, or gladly do, but then backtest them for, which I all did. Uh, if, you, if you don't, if you have the time and if you don't want to just ride along, Always just really check how much edge is there really? How much edge is in the different time frames, in the different instruments? Is it principle based? Um, that kind of stuff. So having a lot of stuff is actually not that great. What's really great is having a few things that are principle based and always working. So what's really great about the CCI release settings is that it gives you a heads up. Uh, on the Vegas pattern, on the zero line reject, on the hook from extremes. And what we haven't discussed yet is these uh, divergences of the of the slow line, of the slow turbo, um, of, the C, of the actual CC, uh, uh, not, the, not the turbo. So uh, especially the, <laughs> at the very end, if you think about it, a Shamu is, is just a a pattern failure. So they use basically a pattern failure to say, oh, well, but this is another pattern that actually works in the other direction. Yeah, well, that's pretty obvious if you have a failed pattern that it works in the other direction besides sideways. Um, that's as, just as a side note. Yeah, thanks for that. So they, so they basically are just, they have 
a narrow lens just on this indicator and they trade strictly from that they don't look at price action at all it's interesting that's 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 correct they basically want to minimize this whole thing and say well we are not looking at price we're looking at a leading indicator and um, i explored with this a lot i also explored with uh meriting this with two other leading indicators there's not that many leading indicators out there um and and this way of trading is simply not doesn't have enough of an edge and if you if you do more research on the company or the people, then you'll you'll get another picture as well. So, it's it's uh, it's only logical that um, an indicator, most indicators are late. This is number one, and the second thing is it's a derivative. So if you have an original or if you have a derivative, that's. Uh, you always basically trading second tier. Why would why would you not go to the original? And, and, uh, it's examining something under a different light, and that has some value. If you say now, I want to know, uh, are we going sideways uh, and uh, looking at a momentum indicator and having a possible look that. Uh, makes it easier to identify uh, what price is doing. That is sensible. But in general, indica indicator trading in general is already bad. Now, I'm not saying you cannot do substitution. So for example, trading without time gives you a completely different picture. And it can be very valuable because um, you can a lot more easier identify uh, contraction and expansion if you take time out because there's so much time that's that's basically just quiet time. Now I'm time focused because I feel like time is the one that's least exploited and you get the most of um, most edges out of that are that are not uh, that haven't been detected by other people. Um, uh, but in general it, it should be really clear that it's not good to just say why don't we look for patterns and indicators that is absolute nonsense because already from a simple principle perspective that momentum indicators don't work in directional markets and uh, or I should, I should say momentum oscillators don't work in uh, directional markets that well if you don't have specific settings if you would want to alter that and vice versa indicators who are good for measuring trend uh, become useless in sideways markets so that already explains that you need to know are we directional or are we sideways? And the indicator won't tell you that, um, but other uh, other observations do. So this it's this desire of the ego to pinpoint something into uh, a simplistic understanding and the market just isn't that. It's the same thing as if you would say, well, I have my dog and I want him to go uh, out party every day at 1.30 and uh, only eat that one item of food uh, every day for the next 50 years. And it's just not, that's not the markets. The markets are a reflection of people and times and uh, a whole society, basically. And we are not, uh, we are not a simplistic institution that always does the same thing. Talk about how the market has changed in the last few years. So for all the newbies who are only trading for the last few years, be aware that this is not the average. You're not dealing with markets that you will see for the rest of your trading career. You're, you're seeing an extreme. Um, so uh, the best thing is basically to grab from all different angles of how you can look at the market First of all, take advantage of that. You get you have it's it's not it's not that complex. I mean, you have you have price behavior. This is up and down. You have uh, time. This is left and right. You have transaction that you can see on the Viva. You have a few abnormalities like uh, opening and closes and all that stuff that I mentioned in the last article that I wrote. So it's 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 too many variables to. Um, be just a quantitative and make this into a formula, but it's not that many variables that you cannot extract the re repeating behaviors that 
we dominantly do with um, the beauty principle. Um, but it should be taken advantage of why would you limit your your ways of looking at the market by cutting things out uh, and having having less less things to play with than uh, a minimalist would be liking to, but uh, he possibly wouldn't catch uh, the usefulness of creating edges. And then ideally from each of these groups of how you can look at the market, take one or two items and find their principle-based great edges and then stack the stuff and then get these kind of hit rates and these kind of low risk uh, entryways. Quad, quad solves literally the rest. Well, you don't need to know where the market goes because if it goes directional, the runner is in. If it doesn't go directional, the runner gets stopped out. So there is no, it's all just in the head that we want to know that we want to be right. But you don't have to be right. You just have to have a few things to, to stack the odds in your favor and then you're the casino owner. Um, so it's a fa fairly simplistic approach. Um, the problem is that many of the educators have problems to create success for themselves, and then they still work a long time in this field and build something to still make a living, but that doesn't mean that all these materials and websites and signal generators out there are actually genuine or have edges to that extent that uh, you can benefit from it on a consistent basis. Back to the floor. <laughs> Back to the floor. <laughs> We're just taking it in. Yeah. So it's it seems that it seems that there's a tendency for us to want to oversimplify it. And then that's when we can get that narrow lens or what you talk about, that blue car syndrome. And it seems it might be easier to sell something that way. But at the same time, it's not as if when, we're, when we stack these edges, it's we're trying to be overly complicated with like 300 things we're looking at either. So it's, it's this like, is exactly it. I mean, this is and this is literally you basically verbalized tra trading's biggest idiosyncrasy, and then also its ultimate truth, which is uh, the ego insists to have it his or her way, meaning. Um, my way or the highway, I I want to trade now. So let's say I'm, I'm it's Monday and I'm ready. Yeah, well, the market doesn't care. The ego says, well, I really like uh, the CCI, especially if it's leading. That's my kind of thing. Yeah, well, if it's not momentum-based trading right now, the directional is just garbage. The ego says, oh, well, I like extremes. I like the opening of the close and uh, different exchanges are opening during the night. And yeah, well, if if there's these phases where, uh, where Asian markets might be leading the whole thing, then there's a half a year where it doesn't. So you, you cannot insist on anything. You can also not insist after three years, let's say you're a newbie and you say, oh, well, I, I want to be done now. I, uh, in one month, we'll, we'll start trading. Yeah. Well, you can, but all you do is lose money because it's only logical that it makes only sense to start trading if your paper trading is consistent. So what you said basically wisely is it's in the, it's in the field in the middle and you cannot choose that field. It's basically away from your personal extremes. It's away from your needs to be met or your expectations to be fulfilled. And um, it's a little bit of a monk thing. Like uh, many approaches are from the monk side from, from different religions is um, that all the suffering comes from wants. And if you think about it, that's true. That's exactly it. E e disappointments and this is what we suffer from, that we don't have something that we wanted or that we don't get our needs met, has as an original first that you have an expectation, that you have a want. And the best kind of trading comes from that point that you say, well, I'm here, I'm present, I give my time, but I don't insist on anything. I, I have certain tools that I have developed and I have certain ways of participating that are useful um but i you, you cannot come and say well i brought the shovel i feel strong 
I slept well and now I shuffle the hole. And then afterwards I see the hole and that's my result. Because it's a participating event and not an event where you you create that foundation with a shovel and then you build your house there. The market is just not like that. Uh, in a way, it's the opposite around. It's basically you are the pet of the market. And if you are within the constraint of who's leading this walk, uh, if you basically... Yeah, if you if you if you bend, let's say, with with the wind of of the market, then you won't be yanked from the market's leash, uh, and you and the market would be very generous to you. But if you're not giving up the need for control and the need for, um, uh, some people say, well, now I have to start trading because I'm broke. I, I, I for five years have just studied the markets and I, I'm out of money. Yeah, well, it's not the problem with the market. It's like you have to either get a second job or you make a pause, or but you cannot force this. And I remember very well when in my first 10 years, I had a couple of these older guys and the internet had just uh, opened up as an opportunity. And there was this, this chat where these guys were always saying, yeah, yeah, you're the newbie. And I'm like, I'm the newbie. I'm doing this for 10 years. And they're like, yeah, yeah. You need some more screen time. I'm like more screen time. I'm look, looking at this thing, eighteen hours a day for ten years, and I didn't want to hear just after ten years suffering. You don't want to hear certain things, like somebody says, "Oh, it's too early. Oh, it takes longer." Or you're underfunded. So one of the one of the most favorite things. And everybody thinks that they can do this with five grand, but you need fifty. It's just, you just need 50, not five. Maybe nowadays with Bitcoin or whatever, and lots of swing and volatility, maybe you need 25, that's fine. But you cannot just start trading with a $5,000 account. It's just not, it's it's not principle-based. Uh, and I hope everybody in this room really knows the underlying reasons for that. So um, it is always this, ourselves being in the way and at, at some point already through this constant abuse of not getting a foot in the using smaller accounts and uh, breaking your own rules and whatever at some point comes this point where you simply surrender and say okay I'll, I'll do it your way uh, because you're tired to blame the market where you really know it's your fault you're tired of excusing yourself with whatever family and friends and and yourself and you're tired you're tired of yourself you're just like the ego way just doesn't work any longer and then comes that, that with that surrender comes the really first biggest breakthrough when you just say okay I'll whatever it takes I'll do whatever it takes I am so baked I am so done I am so ready to just see something else than all the time my own shortcomings and out of nowhere literally it's like it's it's like a miracle. It's like, oh, okay. This is all not that difficult. This is just me all the time being in the way, not not knowledge or experience or education or holy grail or um, literally it only takes this humility of saying, well, okay. Um, I'll, 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 I'll look, I look at a different way on myself. How could I do this? if I would have certain abilities or skill sets. Uh, and then they're, of course, for most of the part, actually already developed because it's not a knowledge-based thing. It's just a behavioral-based thing. But that was a lengthy answer, and I hope I didn't bore the heck out of everybody. No, no. I'm going to check the chat. Uh, does anybody have any trading-related questions or any comments about the trades they made this week? They want to discuss anything and you don't have to write it in the chat you can just speak up the quiet audience <laughs> no questions yeah. come on guys this is the time that one hour a week that's when it's uh when you have a chance to interact um because the rest you can ask in the channels but today is the day where everybody can talk
you can you hear me, Kobe? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay. Um, I'm not quite sure. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I had a question related to the the Fed play, um, but I'm not sure whether you have explained it already on the last couple of calls because I was absent. W would you mind like sharing um, sharing it one more time? No, we can we can talk about the Fed. Okay, the Fed play is a very simple thing. Unfortunately, it is very difficult to do. The Fed play just says one thing, which is the very first move that you get. And typically the move is with the announcement of the numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it is about two or three minutes before the announcement of the numbers. So do not get caught being late. You want to be ready because obviously there's always somebody who already knows. And as soon as the uh, as soon as uh, as the cat's out of the bag, uh, this thing is moving. So there is an initial first move, and as a as a as a first time Fed player, don't play that move. It was, it's, it's basically you would need to play an anticipated breakout and in a very volatile environment uh, that's contracting before. So this is not this is not the prime play. You can, this can be be played, but I wouldn't recommend it. And then comes this, uh, surprisingly, I don't know why people don't backtest these things, but it's really obvious if you have been around, this gets always faded. So there's this extensive move, and then comes a fade. And that fade is typically, like the, the, the probabilities mm -hmm. between 90 to 100% is about 80%. Unfortunately, this can go all the way to 100%. 30%. So meaning this goes uh, even further than 100% against you. Um, so this is something where you have to have scalping skills, meaning you have to basically be able to read uh, uh, a fade. You have to read, be able to be, re to be reading momentum. Uh, it's not that difficult, but that's, that's acquirable if you just, whatever, scalp paper scalp for for a few weeks then you you get a feel for for market momentum and then the, the fed play basically just say so this is move a in, the, in whatever direction this is the direction which we, this that first play said says where is this will be going so if if the breakout was to the upside we're going long then comes the fade and then you want to fade that fade so if we're thinking it moves A up, B down, C up, you want to you wanna play number C. That's the safest uh, play that you can have. And if that play develops into direction, which is about, let me look it up. Hold on. Don't want to speculate. 68% of the time, uh, you get a monster move because you get these first hundred percent. You get a very high hit rate that it continues in the direction of move A, uh, and you can have follow through. That's monster because if you if if there was, we don't have these lately because it's all super news based. But in a regular environment, there's basically congestion for three to three to four days before the Fed meeting. Uh, in, in quieter markets, and then you get this monster directional move. So if you look at uh, moves before, let's say especially before 2008, you see incredible that, that the Fed play is basically makes you as much money as uh, a typical three months income if you if you perfect that, if you do, if you do that well. And uh, so that's a very high probability play. And why is that? Because it's something that you prepared for and that you know exactly what to do and when to do it. Now, here comes the tricky part. Uh, one tricky part is that retracement thing, which is, and you can play that too. You can play move B too if you're just fading that first breakout. Um, that's the second difficult thing so to do. Um, breakout A is most difficult. Uh, fade B is emotionally very difficult to do because you, it doesn't feel at all that you should fade that. It's a really awkward play emotionally, especially since it's a hundred percent retracement. Where that's that's typically that move that crashes all the charts. So you can you have to purely 
pursue this from a momentum basis and not from any kind of chart basis because it goes right through all the levels. It goes right through all, all the stuff that you have mapped out prior because it can just totally kill the charts because it's just volatility coming in. And the, the easiest play is uh, move C, which is uh, in the direction of move A. Uh, then you have, as I said, you have a 68% uh, chance that this goes further. So you literally can finance in our given example when A is a, an up move uh, at the highs of the day, uh, which is a <laughs> can be a monster move. You can have like 80, 100 points on the S&P just for financing. And then uh, it develops uh, direction. So the target can give you another, the, the target might, the first target might be even on the next day. Um, uh, you don't you don't even have to uh, get out. And the runners, obviously, depending where that base was built, uh, can be very nice. Um, now here's the trick. This is unfortunately a very nasty trick, which is you do not know the time sequence. So you cannot say, oh, where do I trade this? Yeah, let's trade this on the five minute chart. Um, and that is because we now all the time have uh, 30 minutes later, the debate, the minutes, uh, or even if it's no minutes, then you have the, you have the debate of uh, somebody talking. Um, and right now, I would say for two years, two and a half years already, the focus is always on this thing. It's like, how, what's the interpretation? Because there is so much speculation uh, just by whatever rate hacks one, two, three, that this is the the lesser degree of a surprise. You Most of the time, these expected numbers fall in place. If they don't, if it's a lot different than what typically the estimates are, then you get this immediate move already. But if you don't, then you basically get that swing instead of a five minute chart, which means five minutes up for the A move, uh, three minutes down for the 120% uh, and another uh, five minutes up before you're at financing. But you get rather the thing in 10 minutes increment. That means first moves, moves up, uh, has a second leg maybe even, then breaks down till 20 minutes past the hour, and then your third leg uh, starts somewhat developing, but the real move comes, uh, and I never understand that either, how, how they do this. They they do these psychological interpretations of the, the first two minutes after half of the hour interpretation of what's coming next, whether, whether this will be a good thing or a bad thing. But the move very often happens basically now at 11.32. Um, so... That being said, uh, you can get into Devil's Kitchen if you uh, have a time relativity error, if you're basically trying to fade something that's not moved yet, uh, or if you try to, to go long uh, 20 minutes early and you have a chop zone uh, on the bottom of the range. So the Fed play in its structure and in its logical understanding and everything, and even with scalping skills, is fairly easy. And you do have a nice edge um, in regards to risk-reward ratios. This is obviously something where you want to be late and not early, meaning turning points themselves are ugly and can be choppy. But once it's turned, then it moves a lot. So this is leading markets and leading markets are engaged late. Uh, so you don't want to be the, the, the first one out the door in uh, catching the falling knife. Um, but the timing is truly challenging or can be, so I should say this differently, can be truly challenging. And what that means is re-entries and re-entries in a uh, wide stop environment because you need a little bit more room for this whole thing. Um, is can be taxing, especially if it's a third entry, or I should say, if you only trade the leg C and you have two entries, that's fine. But imagine you have a time relativity error on uh, move A, that's two entries, and then you have a time relativity error on uh, B, uh, 
uh, now you already had four trades, two winners, two losers. And you're pretty decked out if you do this a third time on C, but typically you need that also two entries for C. So this is your sixth trade within a 30 minute time thing on, uh, on basically scalping techniques that is just difficult um, for for the psyche, for the focus, because you, with, you're reading the tape, f finding out about when the momentum ends, which is a lot, a lot of data. So I, I advise to be out of this whole thing and having a break before the Fed, uh, and if not, having very good confidence uh, in leg C, not adding A and B at an early stage, but rather funking around just with the last leg. But the underlying principle is very simple. It's you you're looking for the left first, uh, first longer leg uh, shortly before, a couple of triple minutes as early as typically, to more likely a couple uh, right on the hour uh, of the first move, and that gives you direction. And then you can obviously also work around these things. You basically know direction now. You can engage however your system or your psychology is good some some uh, i i know people who i taught the fair play who do this literally with breakouts because they're comfortable breakout trainers i just do not like breakouts at all because i feel like i'm not in control and i feel like risk is extended and fields are bad and uh, I'm a control freak with low risk, so for me that's not it. But what I'm saying is the, the great thing about the Fed is you you know when it happens and you know uh, uh, you basically have price as an indicator that says you know, this is where we're going. Um, and it's the, the the odds are staggering that that you go in the other direction than the original move is very unlikely. I think it's somewhere in the higher uh, 80s of a percentile that you 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 have continuation so it's pretty good I, I i like it i just don't advise it for others because even for me it's like oh okay after after Thank a fat day i'm baked hmm. did that shed some more light on the fat play no, of course it did thank you very much kobe but uh, indeed it sounds pretty much uh, tricky so far far beyond my skills but uh, future homework, I would, I would say. <laughs> it's very nice to observe, yeah. Because you will get tickled if you if you each time check and each time like, man, this is each time going in the direction of move A, and uh, you're like, uh, okay, how can I do this and enjoy the process? Is basically like my classical question of anything that's tricky. It might be tricky, but it's worthwhile. Your it's it's worthwhile your 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 focus because, as I said, I really look forward to the Fed each time because you get just phenomenal risk reward ratios. Hmm. Um, this is at first leg like, is typically a little smaller, um, so I I I often skip that, but the other two legs are just like. Um, it's just fun. Why I like leg B too is. I don't mind that fading against the feel right direction. Um, and it gives me a super opportunity when I basically have my exit of my B leg. Uh, and I already made a, a, I already made money. So I feel more confident to expose myself because I, I typically trade a larger size on leg C uh, because of its high probability. And it's it's much easier for me to step into the market not naked but uh, on a reverse. So I basically like ah okay, Lexi like is over here and I get completely out, including with the runner. One of the very rare things where the runners go out, um, and then uh, I'll have this little bit of a break until uh, this turns around. Feel feel again, uh, confirm that I had a good exit, and the thing takes off. So as much as it, I say that it's difficult, not only is it rewarding with master, but it's also, it actually also become, becomes easy because you know that these stops, are, you, you don't have this debate in your head for direction, which you basically always otherwise have, especially when you have contracted markets. Um, you know that it can go both ways, but 
you 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 basically choose a side. And here you don't have to. The market is leading, it shows you where it wants to go. Uh, it just does this weird fade hook in between, and then it takes off. So I I like it. And even if you sometimes, uh, as I said, 60, the other 32% of the time, it just goes sideways. But the great thing is your financing is so big that uh, you don't care if the rest gets stopped out. You still have on the half of your position size, a 40, 50, 60, 80, 100 points uh, S&P. That's, that's just the home run day. So, Kobe, I zoomed in on May 3rd, which I believe was that the last Fed play the guys are saying in the channel? Uh, it looks, certainly looks like it. <laughs> Um, it, it when, like when it. did it start the meeting? Um, because I'm pretty much confused with all the time time conversion um, around here in Europe. But uh, I reckon it's it's about uh, shortly twelve twelve. You have the, the first move up, and then you have a huge retracement and uh, approaching low of the day, and then it shoots off. I, it's too fast about how he moves the chart, so I, oh. I'm still waiting for the starting point, too. I don't know. Here we go. It's it's this state that goes from here to here, so I'll just move it over here. It's, and then he says, Mateo, I sent you the when chart. Is the, when is the Fed announcement? What what time is it? When is it 11.30 or 11? Uh, Hiro, let's see, he sent the chart. Let me, let me get it over here. Oh, I guess I can't show it over there. So here's here's a chart that uh, Rose sent in the channel. This is S&P 500 on a five-minute chart. No, let's go back to you. I like your okay. years better because we had we had a 30-minute break. If you give us back your chart... It just tell us where when it is eleven. Okay, eleven is right here, where my where my hand is, the mouse hand. Okay. Uh, and then we had the move up to the highs. And then eleven thirty is when. Right here. Uh, what kind of chart is this? Fifteen minutes. Yep. 15, yeah. I think it's later, but I'm not sure. Yeah, this yeah, is around 14, this part where it makes the highs at around 1400 hours, which is 2 p.m. Oh, I mean, I mean, I mean, Pacific. Sorry. Oh, yeah. The, what kind of time? What what kind of time? Oh, oh I'm uh, sorry. You've been 11 Pacific. Okay, so that's two. That's two o'clock for me. So that would be around this time. Right here, with okay. my hand. So, it first goes down, fades one hundred ten percent up, and then goes down. Uh -huh. Yeah, I remember now. That, I remember the trading now too. This is exactly it. This is that here you can see that beauty. But the problem is, you have these two choppy. It's, it shows all the problems. See how that you have this two two choppy, fifteen minute bars. Before it's uh, eleven thirty, and then we'll get the move. Uh, now, now her roots chart would be favorable because it's five minutes, or you try to use it to five minutes, whatever. Oh, every time I do that, it takes me out of it. Okay. May 3rd, right? Yeah. yeah. Here we go. Is is that clear, that chart on the 5? Yes, I'm just looking for the times again. Uh, 
11 is 2. 2 is here, first moved out. 110% uh, retracement, down, and then down, down. And this, here's, but, but here's a great thing that you can see. And this is all, this is literally all the time like this. They were hugely waiting for the interpretations. So you see, basically, it's clear when the numbers come out, but it's not clear as soon as they started talking. And we get the continuation, you get financed, and then you get still that job going on. And you have to insist on your original direction. You just got to insist on that. Um, that's really important. And obviously, if you wouldn't have done the 1130, which in this case was obvious because nobody cared whether we get a 25 or a 50 point move. We got the expected 25 anyhow. Um, but what you do not want to do is get out of this move because it's not necessarily that 11.32 Pacific time, uh, all, all weathers are cleared, meaning um, if they wait for more clarity, this thing can go on for 15 minutes. And this is that problem with, with, uh, with the Fed meeting that uh, you don't know the time. You just do not know the time. You cannot say, I trade five or 15 or whatever it is. If it takes another 30 minutes, it takes another 30 minutes. But that the original move is continu continuing in the original move. That's where you have these high probabilities, and that's where you have to lead against. So if you backtest all these meetings, you will find, oh, wow, each time, oh, wow, each time, oh, wow, each time. And that will make you really, really comfortable. So this thing just developed very late. But um, uh, S and P forty ninety five uh, and uh, fade entry forty six sixty five. Uh, so seventy uh, seventy points for uh, the low of day. That means you can, that's where you can go with your second target and then you still have for the next day. Now let's check the next day how much more we got for the, for the runner. Here we have that gap down. That's where you want to get out. No, 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 go back, go back. You don't, you don't want to hold this longer. If you have a gap down, you always want to get out because gaps just get filled. It's too much. Uh, one of the rules that I have for, for Always like how much risk for how much gain. So if I have a close at 40, uh, 95 and it gaps down on me uh, 15 points here or more, you want to cash in because you always get a prime re entry uh, if it, the day develops because SP gaps are always filled, always. Or I should say index or average uh, instruments always have gap fill. So why risk, if, if I get a 15 point extra on my, and I had a, a nice move already of, of of 70 points, why not take uh, an 85 point runner uh, where I have very little probability that this would be going back to this, uh, here it builds that double top at the, at the 97, 97.75, so which makes sense because it's the big number, rounded 100 number. Um, because if if you really want, you can go with a low risk back in. So, not sure how big that stop was, but I would say maybe ten points to have a risk of one issue. He hits hits another eighty five on uh, on seventy eighty five. So you have a one to one to eight risk of water ratio for the runner. That's just that's the trades that. And this is the a random trade developing. This is a trade that you can plan because it's announced. So this is trades that that are just uh, obviously this one is not a very encouraging picture from a harmonious uh, development, but as I said, backtest these things and you will see. Uh, you you certainly I'm not saying you should trade the Fed play, but uh, observing it because you have nothing else to do on that day, anyhow, because it's certainly not days where you make position plays even on the daily or weekly where you where you. Because the volatility is just not good for low risk entries. Low risk entry has to be a a smaller time frame faded uh, action reaction move. Otherwise, it's 
uh, it's too large. It's too it's too risky. Bad bad hit rates. Bad bad stop services. I do sometimes make a an earlier bet in the week on a Monday or on a on a Sunday opening if it's very favorable charts. And if I have a chance to to get basically just runner exposure because those might be further enough away that they can survive, um, but on that day itself you have plenty of time to just like enjoy the observation of how how Fed plays out. And trust me on one thing, really big, especially move B, you cannot feel this. This is not a feelable movie, uh, a feelable, feelable market. The Fed is so counter intuition. Uh, you you need something uh, like the structure to engage because it's it's just and Fed always feels weird. Uh, and typically, Fed always also ruins all the charts. Charts are just the day after the Fed is a very unloving. Day. I mean, as as nice as it looks here. Typically, the day after the Fed is just a bad day because charts need to realign. So much to the Fed play. Any other questions? Yeah. Then, if there's no other questions, we'll we're doing an hour here. Uh, maybe since we're recording, um, some final words from from Matthew. Yeah, sure. Um, make a comment here. Um, I could talk about, we talked about earlier, we talked about indicators and how a lot of them are just derivatives of price and how we would like to use a lot of other tools on, in conjunction with them to not really rely on them. But sometimes you guys see me using this, the AD line, and the tick, I, I like this for indices because at least it's it, they're not derivatives of price. And I have certain rules within an ES system. It's like there's certain, like if this was a Bitcoin, seeing this false breakout, I probably would have skipped this. You know what I mean? But seeing, um, seeing what was happening in the AD line that there was there was waning. You can this basically this blue line was showing that there was weakening of the selling pressure at that time and in fact it was starting to skew up and we were also still above zero in the zero line it just when you see that you can at least think like okay if i was short right now without the selling pressure i'm at least going to cover so it puts you in this mindset where it's like well I'm, i can at least get this for a tradable reaction aggressively take off profits when it gets to the vwap and then just have a rule say okay well if it comes back down and stops me out i'm not going to get back in um, I've already scaled and moved my stop to break even. Now, whether you want to take off half or that's up to you, you know. But just seeing this pattern, even though it's on a smaller time frame, uh, it just didn't give me confidence. It's almost like you already got the little pop. And then you can see when it came back down again, it just, you know, took out initial support right away. Um, but just a a nasty day. I mean, this was at what, 130? Yeah, I mean. I'd have to see what was happening around this time. I, don't, I wasn't in front of the screens, but let's just take a look. This was at 1330. So, I mean, at that time, right, there was a skew for the last few hours. I mean, it's notable. And we were hitting extremes. So, you know, that, that could have also, at least from this reading, if I'm not seeing some major divergence, and we're breaking down on a Fed day. It's like, well, then you might you might want to stay out. But this was a day where you know, just visualizing that neutral day, each extreme that broke the range on the other side got got reversed. Um, but yeah, that's just the one little comment I wanted to add to when we were talking about indicators, momentum indicators. That at least for indices, there's these internals where you know the divergences, which we didn't really have today, can mean something. You know, that can add confluence to a fade setup, you know, as well as looking at the, how the, the momentum is in the ticket uh, in real time. So yeah, that's just kind of what I wanted to uh, end with just a little comment on that. And we'll continue to uh, provide some guidance as we're just looking at this going forward. It's just an, been a really, uh, it just it seems abnormal. It's just a weird, like Corby says, this is, these are unusual times to be getting an education in the market, but, 
um, certainly uh, can add to the experience of it. And then when you come out of it, you're like, wow, okay, this, if I can trade that market, I can trade in any market. So you can, re you can reframe it that way too. No, and it's yeah, a very profitable market still. I, I, I was just pointing out that there's larger and smaller cycles. This cycle is a very profitable cycle. We have a lot of range and volatility and uh, at times great volume too. And uh, now we have aligned the markets again. So the next move will be substantial. And uh, so that's, um, I, I didn't mean to say that this is bad markets or anything like this. I just, I just had the experience when I was developing systems that it can be very frustrating that you, by the time that you develop a good system, which is typically taken for the first system, maybe seven years, you you get your heart broken finding out, yeah, well, this was good for the last seven years, but then it's like a uh, different, different market cycle. And can you trade this too? And I'm like, uh, no. So, if you struggle with a regular structure of sideways down and up markets, needing already three different systems, but then there's exceptions and we're finding ourselves in an exception. That's super tricky because once this phase is over, then we might find ourselves in a regular sideways or directional market again. But if you de develop the system for the ex for these extremes, you're completely flabbergasted if whatever. You know. Typically, like for example, when 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 I developed a system um, in the in the late nineties, and then the dot com bubble was over, um, I had years of ES ranges of four to six points a day. And before I had volatility, and I'm like, uh, I don't know what to do. Yeah, how can I, how, what kind of system do I, it's a totally different system to develop of how you can basically sculpt a box for four points with the box totally six points wide. That's like a stop size right now in some trades. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then you have years of, and it was, it, it it's not that overnight you realize oh this is a different environment you it's basically throughout the months the range gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and you're like I cannot get any much smaller and oh yes it can so you you expect a thirty or forty point range on average for the day and have a maximum adverse excursion of like four and have nice legs within the day even on a sideways day, and then you wake up six months later and your your system is just failing consistently and you hope the expansion is coming, but what actually comes is years of contraction. And obviously that's, you just lose money all the time because you, you, you don't have that concept. I didn't have a room to talk to experienced traders. I was just like, I expect that the trader, that the, the the market to be somewhat consistently the same, but it isn't. And these larger waves is what really gets you noodled up because hope dies last. It's not, it's not that you're, when you develop for seven years, you, you want to execute. Now comes execution and you finally have a little bit of guts or, or a little bit of money saved up or whatever it is. And then it's back to the drawing board and you don't know what's coming from a cycle perspective. So it's like, uh, should I develop breakouts and sideways or should I develop directional or should I develop narrow range? Or... So um, later when all these things come together as a puzzle piece, when you have the four corner piece and then all the, all, all the surrounding picture cutoff pieces together, then it starts to be easier. But you, you basically start out at whatever, one big field of, the red roof on the uh, of the house on uh, on the puzzle and all you all you see is just red all the time, which is your losses. So um, it's it's just tricky. So I just wanted to put a note out that if you if you're new to the markets over the last few years, this this is not the only thing that you need to learn of how to master because this is actually typically a shorter cycle and typically uh, a very rare one. And of course, with that being said, I should right away also say to myself, uh, 
I also don't know. What if this is a 10-year recession cycle? Um, I have a lot of systems, but I certainly haven't seen a 10-year recession myself. So I have to, I, I am constantly constantly developing and backtesting and looking at old charts myself to, to try to anticipate what will be the next cycle, how long it might be, what kind of systems work best. So you're always a student. 30 years later, this is not like, yeah, okay, I know what I know what I'm doing. I mean, I, I might know a thing or two, but I, I know I know nothing. I thankfully have developed a few things to to be consistent, but from a learning perspective of of the market, uh, I'm blindsided all the time. I just find myself all the time struggling, just like you guys are all the time developing new things, back testing new things, changing things. Um, I have these systems that adjust the settings of the indicators, so I constantly have to check are we. Uh, are we a go? Is everything? It's it's. This is all rocket science to, to me. Just just as well. This is not something where you get to a certain level where um, there's a certain clarity or a certain uh, uh, understanding. Far from far from it. This is absolute uh, mysterious. But I have what I have to develop is the curiosity that for me this is all just exciting. I am absolutely excited that I know that I can do this till I'm 95, hopefully, uh, because the skill level is pushing a button. As long as my brain halfway functions, I can do this. So I can do this for a long time. So the time that I lost at the beginning, because you just take a lot longer before you master this thing than most regular professions, uh, I, I can still do later and I won't be bored. My most favorite thing is this, I my my mental makeup is just not allowing for uh, in the name of the golden watch from nine to five. That's just not the character type that I am. So I'm really excited that this thing is providing me all the time with this mystery of oh how does this work and what can we do and uh, but from a from a needs perspective of basic human needs of security for example this is uh, my most uh, forward one for other people it's variety or something else but a contribution for me it's mostly security which is uh, for most people a very high ranking one of the six basic human needs uh, I am finding myself consistently all the time like um, at least slightly worried <laughs> Because I know that this can totally surprise me, and just because I, I want this to provide for my family, it doesn't mean that it will. Because I, uh, I need to keep on my toes. That's why I have very high performing systems. Because at some point, I just stopped trading and said, okay, I, I only will engage in this if I'm absolutely certain that there is at least somebody coming around. Because I, I, I simply cannot afford losing money. I just can't. Uh, I have a child, I have a wife, I, uh, uh, my life is dependent on this as an income source. So, um, But that uneasiness is something that has to be overcome, not with experience, uh, but uh, the, the befriending of the bewilderment of uh, the markets being a field of mystery. And then this sounds also, oh, I don't know, special, but at the very end, uh, if if you're an artist, you're all the time in the dark too, whether somebody buys your painting or listens to your music or eats your cooked food. Uh, and, uh, and, in, and even in fairly average jobs, it's also like in, in these times that we are living, job security, it's not everything. Everything relies on that you have to be trusting to the universe and that you have to be cool, basically. You just have to stay cool. Uh, and not let let anybody derail you of pursuing your dreams and um, have faith that uh, that you come out ahead. Mm -hmm.